super excited to introduce to you one of my favorite people. His name is Ben Gay III. We're going to go on a journey that's going to cover a lot of history, and it's all about what's so good about living and the impact you can make with a simple conversation. So Ben, please join me, and there you are. Here I am. There How are you doing? Are. <laughs> good to see you. It's good to see you too, Ben. For the people who were on the Suicide Prevention Show live, and we had so many tech tangles, I just want to say thank you for being willing to come back, join us, and continue the conversation. You know, the Suicide Prevention Show got started after our first conversation. One of the reasons this happened is because when I first interviewed you, which was for the Woman Entrepreneur Show, you were so gracious to share that our mission to make suicide a thing of the past, to end teen suicide, touched you. And yes. I appreciated you sharing that. And now I want to talk about it some more with you. Oh, swell. I woke up this morning. I always, everything I do is on a calendar uh, here in the office, but I, I take a note home that tells me what I'm going to do the next morning. So when I wake up and go to the bathroom mirror, uh, I have some concept of where I have to be and when. And uh, one of our nieces is visiting. She came in to Gigi last night and said, is Uncle Ben okay? And uh, she said, yeah, I think. Why do you ask? Well, there's a note on his mirror that says suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a little concerned. I had something in mind. And uh, I assured her it was a television program, for lack of a better word, with the legendary Jackie. Oh, there we go. I am a legend in my own mind, <laughs> no doubt. So you are a legend, Ben. For, for people who do not know you, what are you known for? Well, I, it depends on wh where they know me from. I Probably the most famous thing I've done is a series of books uh, called The Closers, and it, mm -hmm. it's on sales training. And uh, I've been a commissioned salesperson since I was 14. I've been at the top of the field making large money for the last 55 years and uh, training and coaching other people. So that's probably what I'm known for. I also, also had a hand in starting the modern human potential movement with leadership dynamics, mind dynamics. They were the forerunners to Est and Psy World and the forum and so on, all those people worked for us and then went off and started their own thing. So if you know me from the human potential side, that's it. But probably selling, coaching, writing. I've written 26 books, uh, 12 under my name, 12 ghost written. I'm, I love to tell salespeople, so they go looking through their libraries. They'll say, I have to get one of your books. I said, you probably already have one. Uh, but I'm referring to the ghost written ones. But I rarely get caught. One time, a guy said, I know you wrote this book. And I said, how? And he said, because you like to use the word stuff, you know, almost like et cetera, you know, mm -hmm. blah, 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 and stuff. And he said, I just read a book by fill in the blank that had stuff four times in the book. Was it you? I said, I'm sworn to secrecy. Ghost, ghost writers don't tell. But that was very astute on your part. <laughs> Yeah, ghost writers don't tell. So That's right. You're not ghost writing today, so we want you to tell all. When the concept of sales merged in my brain with the concept of suicide prevention was the day that I got the fact that a lot of times we sell ourselves on this idea of hopelessness. And to the point that when someone is standing on the ledge or on the bridge, they don't see any other options. It seems like the best idea at the time to take their own life. And I know you've had this intersect your life multiple times. So what is it? What was the first time that suicide came into your awareness? Because it's not a common topic of conversation for most people. 
No, not around the dinner table. It's not. It is at our house. Uh, I, I find if you have a built-in objection, you bring it up first and brag about it. If there's an elephant in the room, talk about the elephant. So everybody that's close to me or family or whatever knows I've had bouts of depression. They know I've had a gun in my mouth, et cetera. And it makes them more open to talking about their own situations, which I think is probably the openness is probably the, the, the best thing you can do for people to let them know it's all right to talk about it, that you don't have to be some strange person. To answer your specific question, though, uh, part of when I became aware was hindsight when I look back and thought, oh, that's what happened to some aunts and so on that uh, uh, had had emotional problems. One of my aunts was treated by the doctor. Remember the movie Three Faces of Eve? Mm -hmm. Well, it was really 25 Faces of Eve, but they couldn't get all that in a movie. Uh, and my aunt was treated by the same doctor for the same reasons. And she was one of those delightful people. Everybody loved her. Uh, she was the, you know, when I, if I'd come home from school in her car, she was living in Florida, we were in Atlanta. Her car was parked in front of the house because she would drop in on the way to the family farm in North Carolina. Uh, my heart would, would skip a beat, you know, Gertrude's here. We're going to have fun. She was that kind of person. But uh, hidden from me, it wasn't a surprise to my father or any of her other brothers and sisters, uh, was the dark side of her. And uh, one day up at our farm, uh, they didn't find her for a day or two, but one day up at the farm with a bottle of pills and uh, a bottle of liquor, she sat down in the kitchen and ended it all. Mm. And... Uh, so, but I didn't know that till later. And then that made me think about other people. I go, oh, maybe that was it. The first time though, it hit me right in the face and I knew somebody who had done it and it wasn't hindsight was I went to school with a guy named George Garwood. And he actually went in the same class with his sister, Mary. And they were both just smarter than heck. Uh, he was the valedictorian of his uh, high school. He was in his senior year, and uh, he was a little different. You know, he wasn't a high school quarterback, to say the least, but everybody liked him, and uh, he went in the backyard, crawled into the family car, and drank a bottle of ant poison one day, and uh, he lived about a block from where we lived. And I was probably a sophomore in high school or something that we all ran over there when the ambulances came and the inside of the car, it must have been a horrible death. The, in, the lining, the headline all had been torn out, I assume in his agony, in his death throes, but he didn't get it out of the car and go get help. He intended to end it. Mm -hmm. And that really got me thinking, you know, how can somebody who's got the world uh, by the tail, valedictorian of his class, Mm -hmm. Probably is going to wind up curing cancer or something. Uh, one of the smartest people I ever met. How can he crawl in the back of a car and end it all? And so I've thought about it starting that day and ever since. It didn't affect me until I was in my late 20s, almost 30. It mm -hmm. was the first time I started having noticeable bouts of depression. And in, in my case, as you know, you're the expert. I'm just a, a struggling human dealing with it. Uh, in uh, some people, it's case specific. Something happens, they want to end it. In others, it's a chemical imbalance is the way I describe it. That's probably not the medical term. Not unlike dry skin. Uh, you know, a friend of mine was telling me how weak people are who consider suicide. He didn't know I was one of them. And I said, how do you feel about people with dry skin? And he said, why do you ask that? And I said, well, they're both chemical imbalances. Do you hate people who have dry skin? Yes or no? He said, well, no. And I said, then you shouldn't hate people who get despondent and depressed from time to time. You're showing your ignorance. And about an hour later of constant lecturing on him, he hugged me and he said, I'm sorry. He just, he, did, he didn't know, and most people don't know, and they don't know how to deal with it. Yeah, well, you're, you're absolutely hitting on one of the biggest myths that I've discovered in this whole conversation about suicide. The, the myth, number one, that you alluded to is that it's situational, 
that something had to have happened. Something must have happened to, yeah. to trigger this. He and, seemed so happy yesterday. Yeah. And so something must have <laughs> happened. And the second, and I call it a myth because the second myth is, is the medical model. The, the fact that it must be a chemical imbalance creating the thinking, creating the mo emotion. And this is not such a clear cut case of cause and effect. They are coincidental. They do coincide. And yet they haven't proven yet whether it's the chemical imbalance that causes the suicidal ideation, the suicidal thoughts, feelings, and actions, or if it's the thoughts, feelings, and actions that create the chemical imbalance. So they know there's a correlation. Yeah. But they haven't chicken, decided chicken the, or the egg. Cause. Yeah. They haven't decided the causal myth. Yeah. So so that's why it's like the number of reasons that people have for why other people would do this, including their weak, is just amazing to me. Um, the number of times someone has said they were so selfish. I'm like, mm, <laughs> yeah. you know, that sounds like it's selfish on your part. If someone is in so much mental and emotional pain that this is the only option they can see, are they selfish to take care of themselves the only way they can see? I'm not qualified to judge except in my own mind and going, you know, we all handle grief our own way. We all handle life our own way. And we all handle this concept of what's possible, what we've decided is possible. And the vision of people deciding that there's only one alternative is probably the greatest source of sadness for me. Yeah, and the, a thought, I can only speak for myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh. I only, I, I drove past a medical school one day. I've never been in one. So I- <laughs> Me too, honey. I, I, I can only speak from my own experience. So. Right. Yeah. That, that's all the experience I have. But one of the things that crossed, crossed my mind, it's not like there's no way out. I'm smart enough to know there is if you wait a while. But I want this to stop now. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm tired of feeling this way. I just want to end it. Uh, and it would be like having a, an itch on your back and you just want to scratch it because you want the itch to go away. Well, I have been in a situation where I wanted the pain to go away. And uh, so I guess we all get there by different uh, roads. What got you out of that then? Well, I'm not totally out of it. I still have bouts of depression from time to time, and mine are never situational. Uh, th things are, you know, by coincidence, sometimes in a rough patch, uh, I'll have that. Uh, but it, the rough patch is never that bad, you know, so it, that's not it. It's just like uh, the biorhythms, you know, they, they go up and down and so on. So, uh, but... It, where I, I've done some things. I don't have a gun in the house. Haven't had for 30 years, because if I can get through the moment, uh, I'll be okay. So if I have to go looking for a gun or go to the gun store and buy one or whatever, uh, probably I'll be okay before I get it. But I've removed that temptation. And uh, I don't take any pills. I, I guess you can take enough aspirin to kill yourself, but I'm only, I have two prescription drugs and I don't think either one of them. I don't think I have enough of either one at any given time to do myself in. It's not hemlock or cyanide or something. So uh, I don't have really that option. And then Gigi and I, uh, Gigi's my wife, Gigi and I talk openly about it. Uh, she, she's not without an occasional bout herself and we can pick up on each other's signs and we know when we want to talk about it and when we don't want to talk about it, but you must, the rule we have is you must talk about it enough to acknowledge it. Uh, in her case, I always say, uh, uh, you're, you're having a little dip, aren't you? And, uh, she'll say yes. So now it's out in the open. I treat her a little more gently for the next day or so, whatever it is, and then I can tell when she's back because she's instead of hunkering down and, and whatever goes through her mind, she's suddenly firing back at me. <laughs> uh, we, lo we love to kid, 
And uh, when she's saying sarcastic things to me, I know we're okay. And in my case, uh, Gigi calls me a powder. I'm not pouting, but I do get quiet when I'm, when I'm not feeling uh, right. And she'll say, oh, we're pouting. I say, I'm not pouting. <laughs> I just have a, I'm having what you would call a little dip. So the good news is you can get it out in the open versus uh, the, the husband or wife doesn't know and the other, whichever one doesn't do it, walks in the bedroom and finds them dead. Uh, I call them the conversations that matter. It's the conversation yeah. that you believe maybe you might ought to have, but you're not quite sure, so you don't. And, and that's the, the, the big challenge. The Center for Disease Control actually named the unwillingness to talk about suicide as a suicide risk indicator. Mm -hmm. And yep. so we know- I don't talk, you, you know how I open I am about the subject. I talk about it when, when that isn't the subject. I talk about it in sales training, in motivational classes. Mm -hmm. uh, I just find it's a cleansing experience because there's someone in the audience who thinks they're the only person on earth that is having these problems. And when they see oh, yeah. Mr. Gay on stage, just got a standing ovation, has a spotlight on him with a microphone, and he says, I had a gun in my mouth, uh, it gives them uh, maybe a little. And, and a lot of people come up to me because uh, I reveal a lot of things about my life in seminars and so on. I find it very effective, therapeutic, et cetera. But I'll say, you know, if you got a little problem with this, when you shake my hand, A, be sure and shake my hand before you leave, just squeeze it twice real quick. And then we'll have a separate conversation. And I'm telling you, it is amazing how many hand pumps I've had. The people come up, Mr. Gay, how are you? And they're laughing, but their hand is giving me the signal. Mm -hmm. They want to talk. And I've had uh, taken somebody out in the lobby and sat down with them and had two or three other people come up and say, I assume we're having the suicide conversation. May we join in? And they pull up chairs. <laughs> we have Making it safe. Group, group therapy. It is extremely common. And, and then uh, when somebody does it and they didn't catch it, boy, it couldn't be. They must have murdered him or something because I talked to him this morning and he was happy, dappy and laughing mm -hmm. and so on. That's got nothing to do with it. If I ever commit suicide, I, I'm not. It's, I got it handled now. Temptation, depression, etc. But I got it handled and I've got an escape valve called Gigi. But if I ever committed suicide, I assure you, everybody would be astounded because I'm the happiest, most outgoing, personal person you've ever met, For the uh, best including in the depths. I gave a lecture on how to be successful in business to a whole big group of people. Included in them was the Harlem Glob Globetrotters at that mm -hmm. time, you know, the United States unit. They were in the, in the room and had interacted and we had a great time. On that day, I was A, suicidal, and B, my house was being foreclosed on. At noon, when I went on the stage in San Francisco at the Holiday Inn, that was when, if I had to come up with a cashier's check to save the house, they were gonna nail the foreclosure notice on the door. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a video of that seminar, Jackie. It was one of the most positive, upbeat seminars I have ever given highly effective, long-standing ovation. Suicidal, big house being taken away at that moment. I can trick you. I think you and I discussed in casual conversation one time, I wanted to perhaps get some mood elevator pills or whatever for my doctor. So I said to him, didn't go in specifically, I waited for my general exam. Mm -hmm. And I said, by the way, Dr. Glang, uh, I have a little bouts of of uh, depression is there anything for that and he said yeah but let's see if you do and he gave me a test put me in a separate room and i filled out a little form mm -hmm. i don't know what it was but put together by psychologists and then i gave it back to his receptionist she got us back together and he said i got good news for you you're not depressed i said mm -hmm. why do you say that well i just scored your test i said you don't think i can beat 
a test like that? This Are is you the big crazy? problem. Yeah. And this is what's <laughs> happening in homes, Ben, is that yeah. parents are thinking they're having the conversation, the one we must have about suicide, yeah. and their kids are gaming them. Their kids know. Sure. The kids know that suicide is a thing. When I went into the local high school with the Make It a Great Day movement and that whole program with the book, when we went around the room, and I asked the teens in the room, do you have a friend who's tried or died? It was not some of the kids. It wasn't even most of the kids. Ben, when I left in the parking lot, I just bawled because I'm sitting in my car recognizing the fact that it was 100% of the kids in the room had a friend who had tried or died or they had. Yeah, tried. I was gonna say, and or they were the friend. Mm -hmm. It's, it's amazing the number of parents who are totally clueless that their child is on the verge of killing themselves because the kids know how to avoid the conversation. The, uh, the thing that has helped our family, we haven't had any immediate suicide since my sister-in-law about 24 years ago, mm. is that openness thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not foolproof. No. Because when you're in that mood, you don't want to talk about it. I'm, you know, mm -hmm. I'm open and honest and so on. But when I'm down a little bit, that's not really the time I want to run around to tell everybody how I feel. And yet uh, it is a, it is the silence that is killing us. Yep. And having Absolutely. family members who know how to be an advocate for you. I mean, Gigi is your advocate and you're her advocate. Yeah, you guys manage to bring and shine a light on the behavior change and go, you, you're having one of those. And just that ability to be in touch with the people that you most care about, what you two do for each other is just beautiful, Ben. It's what I wish for every family, every teacher to be able to do this for their students. I wish every family could do it for their family members. We're calling it, you know, advocate, be an advocate for your tribe, you know, because yeah. what you guys do is the reason that you're still here. Absolutely. Yeah. Minus that little escape valve, I'd, I'd be gone. Uh, it would have been gone a long time ago. Uh, so it, uh, it's having the first conversation is the toughest one. Hi, I get depressed from time to time. Hello, I have been within a millisecond, gun cocked in mouth, millisecond from blowing the top of my head off. Uh, that's the tough one to have. Once that's out in the open, it doesn't leave, you know, what else are you going to be ashamed of? <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, then you can say, well, then I thought about this and this happened and, and, and so on. And the pressure's released, but the first one is the most difficult, opening the can. What prompted you to have the first conversation where you disclosed to Gigi that you were having a challenge? How did it, that come up? Yeah, how did that come up? What was the I told for the first one? The uh, gun in the mouth was before Gigi and I knew each other. Right. And, and uh, so on. And that was far enough in the past where I could talk openly about it. And she said something like people do when they first hear something like that. Well, how could you ever be in that situation? And I said, well, that wasn't the last time. <laughs> last time with a gun. I was smart enough to get rid of the gun. But uh, I've had them since. Tell me about it. And we started down that path. And then if you listen carefully, they usually, usually often say things like, oh, well, I've been there. And that's how we opened her can of worms and discovered, first time she said she was having a dip, I thought she called me a dip. I said, what did you say to me? <laughs> oh, I can only imagine that you might have reacted just as much <laughs> to being called a dip, Ben. You, you do not insult easily. Yeah, no, you don't take no. those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, that was sort of it, talking about the past, which I guess may have been my sneaky way of bringing it up. 
Mm. Here, I will tell you about something that happened years ago that has no effect on my current life. Mm -hmm. I, I was suicidal. Uh, literally. I mean, you know, people say, oh, yeah, we all get down. No, 357, cut, in mouth. Aim to turn my office chair around so there would be less blood splatter in the office when they found me. Mm -hmm. uh, and they go, oh, you, you mean suicide? I said, yeah, you want me to spell it for you? <laughs> suicide. Uh, and I, let me touch on that for just a second, because Ogmandino, I, you, I've told you this before, Ogmandino inadvertently saved my life by telling me that Ogmandino, for those of you who don't know, great speaker, author, writer, now gone, wonderful gentleman, used to do some seminar work for us. Uh, he used to tell the story about he wanted he, he was a despondent drunk, living on park benches covered with vomit. I mean, he was really down and out on several occasions. So he decided he wanted to kill himself. And there was a pawn shop. He knew in his heart that he must have a gun in there. And he went over to buy one. And they were $39, which, as he said, was exactly $39 more than he had. Nice. So that plot failed and the mood went away. Frequently, if you can get through that moment, uh, you know, in, in an hour or a day or whatever, that's gone. You'll face it again, but that moment is gone. And then on another occasion, he had the same feelings and he had the $39 or the gun or whatever. Mm -hmm. Being guard from a gun was not a problem. So, and, and we were having this conversation because I had opened up about feelings about depression and so on. And he'd said something on stage that, that told me maybe there was a little something else going on with him. And uh, I said, what stopped you? He said, well, I put the gun in my mouth. And he said, Ben, I tasted, literally, I tasted defeat. Mm. The taste, I guess, of gun oil and maybe the gun had been recently fired, but a very distinctive taste. And he said, that to me was the taste of defeat. So I put the gun down. And uh, he said, I haven't come that close to the brink since. I thought, well, that's an interesting story. I even told it a couple of times to, to people. Then... Uh, Freud said the worst things that can happen to you for a man is to turn 30. If you were alive today, I think he bumped that up a little bit, but turn 30, get fired, and your father died. Mm. And I had all three happen within six months. Uh, unfortunately, I heard about Freud, read that Freud had said that. So maybe, going back to what you said about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, mm -hmm. I'm 30, I just got fired, uh, and uh, my father died. Maybe I said, oh, there's the ticket out. Uh, I'll commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah. And Freud also said all normal people consider suicide at some time in their life. So, you know, I, Freud almost did me in. But anyway, I had he the gun. He gave you permission, right? Yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Uh, I had the gun for security reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. Big house on the hill known for being wealthy and uh uh, probably looking back, that's not where I should have lived. But I got a pistol coach, learned how to use the gun, the positions in the house that were best for defending the family on top of the spiral staircase and so on. So there's the gun. I have it. I go through the thing. Uh, my wife is gone. It wasn't Gigi. It was my first wife who's now gone herself from cancer. And my son, oldest son, Ben the Fourth, was at school just down the hill from the house. And here we go. I'm alone. I don't have to explain this to anybody, whatever. I put the 357 Magnum in my mouth and I tasted defeat. And Ogmandino flashed back in my mind and I put the gun down and the moment passed. That's really key. We put the thing down and recognizing that what Freud said about every normal person has suicidal thoughts. When I first drafted my TEDx talk on how to end the teen suicide epidemic, my first draft had that information in the talk that suicidal thoughts are normal. And the fear of them, the fear that someone will think that we need to go see someone, that we have a mental illness because we have a suicidal thought, that 
fear is actually the problem. That's what tricks our brain into mm -hmm. a negative echo chamber. And my TEDx coach said, I've never had a suicide. You know, he said, you can't say that on stage. And I'm going, but you know, it's been written about in the annals of psychoanalysis <laughs> for, ever since this was born, this whole field of yeah. study. Um, but the belief system that says normal people don't have those kinds of thoughts, that BS is so strong that the stigma of there must be something wrong with me prevents us from yep. sharing. And what you're doing in the world, Ben, by openly sharing, by openly having this conversation, even from a stage, is breaking the silence. And what we know about breaking the silence is it opens the door for people to start the conversation. And if we can start those conversations, we can keep people here. They'll decide to stay. So a, a little positive input at the right time can make all the difference in the world. I told you I had a business partner years ago. He's gone now. But um, he went, unbeknownst to me, he went to lunch with a young man, young man, 35, I'm guessing, something like that. Uh, on some business deal they were working on. I had nothing to do with it. But somewhere in the conversation, my partner said uh, something about Ben Gay. And the guy drops his head and starts crying. And Sam, the partner, said, I thought to myself, my God, am I in with the wrong guy? What is? What, what did Ben Gay do to this guy? <laughs> <You know? laughs> And, uh, and I'm listening to the story that Sam is telling me, and I'm thinking, oh, my Lord, I've, I'm, try I'm running through every business deal I've ever been in. Uh, I don't think I've been in one bad enough to make somebody fall into their soup and start crying. Well, it turns out I had met him at a seminar. He might have been a hand pumper. I don't know that, but maybe he was. And uh, he called me one day, and he lived in San Francisco. I lived in Marin County, and said, can I come over? and uh, spend a little time with you. And I didn't know you could charge for coaching yet, so I said, sure. And uh, he uh, came over the Golden Gate Bridge, came to my house, and we had a lovely chat. And I thought he was a winner, and I told him so, and he had a, some business deal he didn't seem very excited about, but I told him I thought it was a great deal. He just needs to pursue it, set specific, I gave him the, you know, the Ben Gay pep talk. And uh, he left the house, and I may have talked to him a few times again over the years, but uh, we didn't do any business together. That wasn't the purpose of the meeting. When he started crying in front of Sam, he, he said, he said, I called Ben Gay up. I was at the end of my rope and asked if I could come see him. And he said, yes, Sam, when I drove over the Golden Gate Bridge, the uh, suicide note was on my dashboard. My belongings that I wanted with me were neatly folded up. I don't know what that is because I picked up 14 jumpers off the Golden Gate Bridge. They always leave a note and they always leave a neat pile of something somewhere in their car at home or whatever. It must be part of the thing. Anyway, he said, I, I had to talk with Ben because my plan was if that didn't work, if that didn't save me on the way back across the Golden Gate, I was going to park mid-span and go over the rail. It was a done deal, suicide note on the dashboard. And uh, he said, I had the talk with Ben, drove back, back across the gate, uh, started the business that we've been talking about and have been successful ever since. And that's the reason I'm having lunch with you, Sam. So my point is that's not me saving somebody from suicide. It never crossed my mind. Yeah. It was just by coincidence doing the right thing for somebody at that time. And since that time, I'm fanatical about talking to people, a, sp a waitress in the old days, I might have said, manager, please, could we have a different waitress? This one is surly and nasty and mean or whatever. I rarely encounter that but from time to time you do. Yeah. Now I want to know why she's that way oh. and how I can help if at all, if only by kidding her, uh, kidding with her, over tipping, saying, if you need to talk about something, I'm here. I don't have any skin in the game. I don't, you know, I'm not on one side or the other. 
uh, but uh, has I, any waitress ever taken you up on that invitation to yes. yeah, they're grumpy and you invite them to have a conversation yes frequently hmm. you get, I, I've got antennas now of where I can tell you know it, it, risk of sounding crude it might just be her time of the month it might be she and her husband had a fight that morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I, do, I don't know, but I probe around enough to see if there's something there worthy of talking about. And yeah, I've met many people for coffee afterwards or, or at their break or, or here's my business card, you call me. I probably go through a, locally 100 business cards. I went to hand a business card to somebody not too long ago who was in that mood. I said, here's my card, you call me night or day if I can ever be of help to you. Gigi and I will come get you if you've got a problem. And as I went to hand her the card, <clears throat> she reached in her pocket and pulled out one. She said, Mr. Gay, I already have one. <laughs> <laughs> so we know that your business card is not quite a magic wand. It doesn't cure everything just because somebody has it in their pocket. Yeah, they might okay. still be moody. Yep. And Th things, things can come up. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, that I'll answer any specific question you have. My other just right in the face, oh my God, this is more common than I thought. The Golden Gate Bridge, not too long ago, experienced its 1,000th or 2,000th jump. I forget, it was a big number. Uh, but I picked up when I was in the Coast Guard stationed at Fort point right under the Golden Gate, uh, I picked up 14, I, my crew and I picked up 14 jumpers. I never got a live one. Occasionally read about a live person who hit the, a breaking wave right at the right time, vertical and so on. Most of them don't do that and they hit very hard and break every bone in their body and tear their clothes off. I mean, it's just incredible the power of coming down hundreds of feet and landing on hard water. Uh, so, but uh, well, I said that to say those people, wait, 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 we, we got to back this up just a little bit. Cause you said yeah. something that just defies the imagination for me, never having been in the coast guard or working under a bridge, which sounds funny to say that you worked under a bridge. Um, but anyway, yeah. so you, you worked under a bridge. Somebody decides that they, they need to take an in their life and they take the leap and they jump off the golden gate bridge and they don't plunge into the water. Oh, no, 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 no. They, they, they don't, most don't pierce the water. You have to jump generally from one end of the bridge or the other where the waves are breaking on the rocks and there's some white surf and so on. And so then hit what happens you know, if, like a spear. Okay. But if you jump from the middle span and mm -hmm. so you don't have a chance of that happening, most of them land flat, a belly flop or on their back. And when that happens, they don't break the surface of the water at first, the surface tension it's called of the water. It's like uh, jumping off a tall bridge onto your local highway. And wow. they, I saw one, uh, and when you pick them up, uh, men, I was most aware of it, usually what's left is uh, tatters of things, you know, maybe a shoe or whatever, a leather belt with the pockets of the pants hanging down. The pants are gone, but the pockets hang down because they're more attached to the waistband, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but I, I got where that was sort of normal to see. Wow. We were, a Czechoslovakian freighter was outside the gate out by the Fairland Islands and a guy crushed his hand in something. They put him in the captain's dinghy and were racing him in to us. We went out to center span to wait for him, to put him on our cutter and take him over to the dock for uh, the ambulance that was waiting. We're just sitting there wallowing around in the water and I look up and here comes a bright uh, floral dress of a lady over, uh, it turned out to be a lady, coming over the railing. I saw her leg come up, I saw the flash of color uh, and so on and I said, guys look, it was nothing we could do about it, but she then brought the other leg over, twisted around, and here she came. And when she, she landed, I'm guessing, 30 feet from our uh, cutter rescue boat, and she landed and she bounced up a foot or two. 
and then bounced, it landed again and didn't break the water that time, but she sort of, you know, settled in and then she started down and that's when we got her. But I saw her bounce. So the, the, I didn't know any of the 14, don't know their stories, anything other than something I read in the paper the next day. And of course, they all say, uh, there must have been something wrong. It was never her or never him, bright and happy, talked to him this morning, had bright, you know? but they were like my friend. The suicide note was written, was pro has probably had been written for quite some time. I think that's probably the biggest truth that if we could get this out to people, there probably are not any signs that you would pick up on. It's not that there's a sign that you miss. So, I mean, I'm only doing this whole work because I'm the mother of a suicide attempt survivor. I got really lucky. My daughter's still alive. Her suicide attempts began over 20 years ago when she was 14. So I've lived the nightmare that I don't wish on any parent, but I'm here to tell you that when you lose someone to suicide, the world will try to go for why. And they will just, and your own brain pounds for why. And the answer is that it was the best idea they had at the time. And if you ever read a checklist, like the Center for Disease Control has a checklist of these are the warning signs, don't do it. Don't go there if you've lost someone to suicide because you'll think, oh my God, I missed it. Yeah. At least that's it's my happened. fault. And then we take that on and it prevents us from grieving and it prevents us from loving and especially loving ourselves. So my invitation is to just assume that everyone you know is at risk and be willing to start the conversation. Be a bin, start a conversation, be their advocate for living. And so that's my invitation to everyone watching and listening to this interview. Ben, I cannot thank you enough for being willing to come on to the show and share your story and how powerful it is. You don't know whose life you're going to save, obviously. Well, Ogmandino saved mine without knowing it and uh, in advance. I saved the young man who was going to jump. But you know, but you miss some. My sister-in-law, first the first time I ever socialized with her, she I, I hadn't even met her sister who I married yet. I just met her because she was the apartment manager and gorgeous. The first night I was there having dinner, I, I was sitting on the sofa where I could see in the kitchen, and she was rattling something, and it was a bottle of aspirin, and then she would take a handful and throw them down the sink. And I said to her husband, Fred. Uh, what's going on with Liz? And he said, oh, that's her suicide thing. I was supposed to get all upset about it, and, you know, run around. He, he says, is she throwing them down the sink? I said, yeah. He said, forget about it. Well, it was 30 years later when Liz wrote a note that said, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of dying, but I am afraid of living. Left it on the kitchen table took a lit hibachi barbecue grill into her bedroom and took her life and uh, uh, asphyxiated herself. Uh, and there is a bright side. She had a miserable little dog named Annie who everybody hated, who sat on Liz's lap and snarled at everybody his, her whole life. Mm. She took Annie with her. So there, there was even an upside to that. <laughs> We're rid of Andy. But, All right, so, but so Liz said, I'm not afraid of, of uh, dying. I'm afraid of living. That's the other myth. The mythology of suicide is people think that others take their own lives because they want to die. That's not true. They're not looking to die. They are simply not willing to live another day yep. with the mental and emotional or physical pain that yep. they've been in. So that, thank you, Ben, because I want to make sure that I bring that up. The, the myths are many, the stigma is mighty, and we're here to blow the lid off of the myths 
to remove the stigma and to normalize the conversation around suicide. Why? Because we want you to stay. Whoever's listening to this, we want you to stay. We need you here. Heaven does not need another angel, damn it. Heaven knows. <laughs> There we go. That's my, that's mine. And I'm sticking to it. That's my attitude. That's my answer. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. You're a delightful <laughs> lady. You and you're, you're doing God's work. It's, um, it's not the work I wanted to do. It's not the work I ever thought I would do. And it's certainly not something that I want to talk about, but I realized that we must, Ben, we must because the silence is killing him. And so let's just keep in the conversation. For everyone on this show, thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for listening. Ben, thank you very much for sharing. Thank you.